Hi everyone, this is Phil Travis, and uh, this week's lesson is on the Great Depression and the New Deal. And there's really two parts of this lesson. This lesson, this is part one, and then the next video is part two. So the first one, we're going to look more at the causes of the Great Depression, and then in the second video, we're going to look at the New Deal, specifically. So first of all, um, the causes of the Great Depression. You know, the Great Depression was caused by a series of events, very similar to actually the cause of World War I. You had kind of a number of different things that were set up and a series of events kind of knocked them over like dominoes in a way. Um, throughout, by the end of the 1920s particularly, but throughout the 1920s, the United States more and more began to see a problem with overproduction. Uh, manufacturing increasingly outran the spending power of the populace and the, and the needs of the populace. And this was also, by the way, if you look down to the bottom, this was exacerbated by a European economic crisis. And of course, the European economic crisis was very much caused in part by the end of World War I and the Versailles Treaty, which left the German economy in absolute utter shambles. Um, and so by the late 20s, the European economic crisis really began to worsen. And this affected, you know, obviously um, um, trade markets for the United States. And so overproduction <clears throat> was a big problem in the United States and not just farmers overproduction. Overproduction in terms of manufacturing and industry uh, became a very big problem by the late 20s. And of course, farm overproduction became particularly acute. Um, and there was an, uh, an incredible amount of farm, farm closures uh, and evictions. And I'll show you the numbers here just a little bit during this period. Um, also, of course, one of the biggest causes, uh, two of the biggest causes for the Great Depression were unregulated market activity and unregulated banking activity. Um, both of these, the United States has since, during the New Deal, it was during the New Deal, took action to fix these problems. And uh, by and large, they did fix the problems, though um, there were certain things that were overlooked that had the system worked properly in 2008, um, we might not have had the issue that we had. Uh, I'll mention that a little bit later. So the market, um, the market was, you know, the markets are speculative and the rising and falling of, of stocks is based largely on futures predictions. In the 1920s, the market was continually gaining and going up and up, and speculations like effectively continued to 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 uh, you know drive these futures up and up, um, and this encouraged a huge amount of people to enter the market in hopes of getting rich on the bull market, as it's called. And the market was like the philosophy during the 20s, um, the political philosophy during the 20s, which was more hands-off, more regulatory, more unregulated kind of laissez-faire capitalism. And so the market wasn't really regulated to a great degree. Um, margin bidding was rampant, um, which in short, you know, this was the basic practice that, that people in the market used to invest in the market on loans. And the idea was, in some cases, you even had people who put merely 10% down. So you paid for 10% of the stock. And then the rest of the 90% was provided by a creditor. And you then, of course, owe the, the creditor the money. Um, and when you, the idea was when your stock went up and you sold, you would make a, you would make, you'd pay the money back and you'd make a little profit. That was a, that, the fact that it wasn't regulated and it wasn't controlled uh, was a very big problem. And it led to a situation in which you had $6 billion that was basically this, 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 this debt that was in the market. And that $6 billion of debt that was in the market was uh, actually more money than was in circulation in the United States. And so it was an incredibly volatile and dangerous situation when you look at it like that. Because, <clears throat> of course, we know stocks go up and stocks fall. And, you know, when there's, um, you know, uh, when, the eco when the economies go down in Europe, it's going to affect the stock market in the United States. And so in a lot of ways, it was only a matter of time before stocks dropped and stocks fell and all of that debt became a problem as less and less people could pay back the money they owed. Another was, of course, unregulated banking activity. Um, banks were, commercial banks were involved in the market um, for their own gain. So they would 
you know, banks loan your money out. You know, that's what banks do, and they make money on the interest. Well, banks would also enter into the market, and uh, they would effectively play the stock market and try to use the market to for their own their own gain. And actually, uh, you know, this was very obviously a very dangerous practice because. Um, you know, if the if the banks have lots of money in the market too, then when the market begins to go down and there's loans out and loans have to be called in, banks begin to fail. And then the, the chain reaction is, is that when um, when banks start failing, say because of a drop in the market, because the bank is invested in the marketplace and the market drops and the bank's losing money, and so the bank's losing money, it ultimately has to, to stay afloat. It ha they have to call in loans, and. So when this starts to happen and, and other people are losing all their money in the stock market or their farm is being evicted and they can't pay these loans back immediately, then what happens is people, the banks close. And when a bank closes in the 1920s, there's no insurance on this. There's no safety net on it at all. If a bank closed, you lost everything. And there were literally something like 9 million life savings that were lost at the outset of the Depression. Sorry, guys, my phone just beeped on me. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, I should have put that. Okay, it's off now. Um, so going back to what we're saying, though, is that you have this situation now uh, with the unregulated banking practices. There's no insurance on your on your savings. You the bank closes, you lose everything. And so what happens when the chain reaction sets off after the stock market, really after the stock market crash in October of 1929, um, people would rush the banks because you went, you went as fast as you could to try to get out of, get your money out of the bank. Because if the bank closed, you would lose everything. And um, of course, the reality is, is that uh, uh, in the first three years of the depression, five thousand banks closed, and it took, like I said, something like nine million savings with it. Um, so it was a very dangerous situation in which you had an unregulated market, you had unregulated market practices being conducted not only by individuals but by banks. You had you had speculate you had speculation um, land speculation corruption fraud basically where people's farms would be you know priced at a higher value than they were and things like this that really uh, it made it a big it, it meant that when the crash happened in October uh, of 1929 that you were going to have a chain reaction of events and those events were going to be catastrophic banks were going to close people were going to lose life savings and, and and that was what happened and so one of the reactions to this to, to to obviously the depression is to reform the banking system and the market practices of the time. So as I mentioned, this is the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This is a stock market crash being covered in the newspaper in October of 1929. There were um, there were warning signs before this happened. I mean, farmers were in huge problem as far back as 1925 um, because of overproduction largely. Um, the European economies, particularly Germany's economy, Germany's economy was really tanking earlier than that. And in fact, at the outset of, of 1929, there were kind of there was there were more bank failures than would be expected. And so there was volatility that was clearly present. This map right here gives you a look at um, unemployment and um, also um, migrations and in and, and areas where you just how the depression is affecting different areas of the country if you can see the green arrows the green arrows depict migrations of people and so you see the area going to california from the midwest the blue stripes in kansas and oklahoma and north texas that's all the dust bowl you know that's where they have incredible drought and the farmers are evicted in mass and they the novel grapes of wrath they move to california and uh and there's huge migration there. There's also huge migrations to um, um, places like Chicago. Um, the Rust Belt areas in Ohio were particularly hit hard by the Depression. We'll talk more about that momentarily. So here's the numbers. And, and Herbert Hoover, of course, was the president when the Depression hit in 1929. And Hoover was a... Um, he was a businessman, and of course, similar to his the previous two presidents, Herbert Hoover, believed very much in, in a less regulated laissez-faire capitalism. 
when the depression hits, Hoover, it's it was not his it wasn't his fault, and he wasn't responsible for it. Um, but once the depression occurred, he's really the wrong man for the problem. And he did he did do some things that um, that that helped a little bit. He greatly expanded, for example, um, the federal government's public works fundings, um, and hence the building of the Hoover Dam, which you know has his name, which creates Lake Mead, obviously outside of uh, Las Vegas. Um, but he didn't believe in going much further than that. And certainly he didn't believe in giving relief to the everyday Joe, um, the people who were out of work during the great depression. There's, as you see at the top, you had one to 2 million people and also 200,000 children who were homeless. They were roaming the cities, uh, roaming the countries, going from city to city. The Great Depression is a period in which hobo culture is a very real thing. And folk American, folk, American folk artists like um, Woody Guthrie, um, they wrote songs about this. And actually, hobo music actually influenced classic country artists well through the 60s, including artists like, like Merle Haggard. Um, you had at the height in the country, you had and over uh, across the country, you had 25% unemployment, which is incredible. But what's even more incredible is that there were places like Toledo, Ohio, which is a rust belt area. Steel industry was hit very bad. Production fell through the floor. Um, in Toledo, Ohio, uh, unemployment was 80%. In Cleveland, Ohio, these industrial northeast towns um, or Midwest towns, Great Lakes towns, in Cleveland, Ohio, 50% unemployment. So um, in the so-called Rust Belt, it was particularly bad. And of course, as you see down on the bottom of the screen, um, the unemployed in places like Cleveland, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, they would, they would create these makeshift shanty communities, usually outside of a job site where they waited for potential work. And they called them Hoovervilles. They named them after President Hoover. A homeless person's blanket of newspapers, they called Hoover Blankets. And... Um, a pocket turned inside out, they called a Hoover flag. So Herbert Hoover, you know, even though he, you know, he so he he absolutely sympathized with the situation, and he did try to do some things, but it just simply was not enough, and he he didn't believe in the kind of government action that FDR was going to take. In fact, to give you an idea of the sort of political attitude of the twenties, Calvin Coolidge, who was the president. Uh, before Hoover referred to some of Hoover's pro uh, policies um, with relation to like exp extending easy uh, credit and these types of things um, as socialist. And so her, her, like Calvin Coolidge's predecessor absolutely saw him as going too far. And so that really gives you some perspective on, um, on the difference in ideology between Hoover and Coolidge, but then also FDR. Um, Hoover believed in voluntarism primarily, which at this time was, was really never going to work. Um, but he believed in voluntary actions by corporations. So at the outset of the Depression, he had meetings with company leaders and he cut, he, he cut taxes and encouraged them to hire new employees. Um, but it, it was all voluntary. And because of that, it never really actually, um, it never really is effective. The corporations are trying to stay in business. They're trying to maintain the bottom line. And many, many businesses went out of business at this time. Um, and so um, it was only the biggest companies and the biggest corporations that really were able to maintain their stability. Um, but it, it, the, voluntar the voluntary approach at the outset of the Depression just really was not going to work because the corporations were not, they were not going to volunteer things that they thought ran counter to their sustainability basically um and as their and as their and as consumption dropped and dropped and dropped because of a lack of of spending you know lack of uh, obviously um spending power in the united states companies you know they they lost more and more money and their production continued to decrease and they had to continually lay off workers um Hoover also worsened the Depression when he passed the Holly, at least some have argued this, when he passed the Holly Smoot tariff um, against the advice of his, of his, uh, of some of his best advisors. Um, the Holly Smoot tariff was passed in, in 1930 and um, 
This was at the pressure largely of farmers, and it was a huge hike in the tariffs on farm products like wheat. It was as high as 70%. A lot of industrial products as high as 30% of a tariff and import tax. And, um, and this really devastated um, European trade with the United States, and it meant that it meant that, that, that the United States and Europe's trade became kind of cut off at this time. And a lot of historians, and, and it's very commonplace amongst economists in Europe, economic historians, that this action, um, sort of isolationism during the Great Depression, really worsened the Depression. And if that we could have enhanced, um, continued to work on trade, world trade, particularly trade with Europe, that maybe it would have been not as bad. Um, Remember that at this time, there's no unemployment. You know, um, 1932, Wisconsin was the first state with unemployment, which was very fitting, of course. That's from where La La uh, Fighting Bab Bob LaFollette was from. It was really one of the first progressive states. And um, um, Wisconsin was the first with the state unemployment, but there's no federal unemployment. Um, these types of things don't exist. If you lose your job, you lose your job. If your bank closes down, you lose all your money. And that's why maybe some of you have grandparents uh, who lived through the Depression and they used to keep money under mattresses. Um, um, and that's from the Great Depression. That's from the insecurity of this period. A third of all farmers, and you'll get this, you'll get this feeling when you read Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, a third of all farmers were evicted from their property during the Great Depression. A third. It's an incredible thing to think about when you put that in, put that in perspective two million homeless people um roaming the country it's uh it's very difficult for us to understand just how grave a situation this was this is a picture of a hooverville um pretty sure this is this is cleveland ohio When you got to 1930, um, a lot of businesses, you know, had gotten to a point where they were either going bankrupt, which many, many did, or laid off workers. It was that bad. And, um, you know, I mentioned the, the unemployment rates in Cleveland and Toledo, but, uh, you know, many Americans at this time, they did not want something for nothing. They didn't want a handout. And they felt a, they, it was a psychological thing. They felt, and hence depression, which, uh, which, by the way, actually, on a side note, you, you know, um, Herbert Hoover actually came up with the idea to call it a depression and not a panic because he thought it sounded not quite as bad as a panic. Um, just a little bit of food for thought. But um, many Americans took a personal guilt over their failure to get a job. And, and it was really something of a, of a psychological crisis for, 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 for Americans and a lot of men who had been breadwinners before and now couldn't provide for their families. Of course, in the election in 1932, uh, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, against Herbert Hoover. And Roosevelt's victory, for a lot of reasons, was probably already sealed. Um, when you, uh, Herbert Hoover was, um, the people were screaming for Hoover to do something for the common person. And all the common person really ever saw Hoover do was try to um, make trickle-down economics work to effectively um, 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 make things as easy as possible in corporations and hope that jobs be provided. But Hoover really never um, actually provided direct relief for the people. Um, he really didn't believe in that. Um, and as a result of that, Hoover was very vilified for um, his action in the Depression. But if, it, if that alone did not um, guarantee his loss to Franklin Delano Roosevelt... The so-called Battle of Anacostia Flats did. Um, this was a period in, uh, in, in 1932 during the election, a um, group of World War I veterans called the Bonus Army went to, the, went to, the, went to Washington, D.C., and they established a, a, a Hooverville. And they were out there protesting because they basically said they had, they had pensions that were due to be paid. I believe they were due to be paid in a decade. And they wanted their pensions paid in full then because they needed it because they couldn't feed their families. They needed the money. And so they were, they were protesting. They were asking Hoover to, you know, basically give them their pensions early. Hoover refuses, of course. 
And the Bonus Army and their protests occupied several government buildings. And ultimately, General Douglas MacArthur, yes, the same General Douglas MacArthur who becomes famous for his campaigns in New Guinea uh, during World War II and in the Philippines, and of course, ultimately in the Korean War, um, a young General Douglas MacArthur was sent in to disperse the World War I veterans uh, with tear gas and basically riot police. And FDR uh, acknowledged privately after the news of what they called the Battle of Anacostia Flats. Um, he acknowledged that this pretty much guaranteed his election. And when you think about it, it's not surprising that he would think that. I mean, you have a president who's being labeled with the Depression, Hoovervilles, Hoover flags, Hoover blankets. And then you see, you know, when the people are asking him for him to do something for them directly, he's having veterans dispersed by force. Um, so... Uh, you can see how Hoover was not very popular at this time. And of course, he loses the, the election in a landslide. FDR, I think, had 57% of the vote. 